Welcome to At Home With, I'm Beth Fisher, ITV Wales' sports reporter. Obviously during this lockdown there's been absolutely no sport, but thanks to modern technology I've managed to keep in touch with sportsmen and women across the country. Hope you enjoy. Matt Grimes, Swansea City Captain, thank you very much for joining us on At Thanks Home. How are you finding it at home? Yeah, not too bad at the moment. Not too bad. Um, kind of just filling up my day with um, all sorts of stuff, really. Trying to keep busy, as uh, I'm sure most people are. Yeah, and it's, it, obviously we're now into a, a few weeks into lockdown. Uh, as you as a professional sports person, how's it been not being with your teammates and at, at the ground? Um, difficult, to be honest. Um, I think it's something you take for granted. Uh, I'm sure everyone in, in their work environment speaks to, I don't know how many different people a day. And now you've gone from that to, to living at home with your other half or, or just your kids. And it's um, the lack of, um, I don't know how I should put it, the social interaction is, is probably the most, uh, the most difficult thing when you go in, especially in a football environment, you have a lot of banter and, and the lads um, bounce off one another. So that is, that is something I am missing. Yeah, and obviously for most people, they can still work from home. But obviously, you're an athlete. So how are you keeping up your fitness? Uh, well, we're getting our training programmes through um, from the sports scientist once a week, once every couple of weeks. Um, just to make sure we're, we're staying ticking over and, and staying fit for when the, um, when the league starts back up again. Yeah, and, and in terms of, you know, football skills, you, you practice in the garden, what, you know, you, you like most of us doing things like that? Well, I, I've, I've got a dog, so I'll I kick the ball around with him. Um, that, but that's the, uh, that's the extent I'm going to at the minute. Um, since, since we left, I don't know how long ago it was now, four weeks ago. Um, I've, I've not kicked a football um, properly since then. So the first week of training could be a bit interesting. And it's unprecedented times, isn't it? I think none of us really realise the impact of having no sport to do or, ha or no sport to watch. Now, as a professional mm -hmm. footballer, you know, you obviously, I'm guessing you enjoy watching sport as well. So how do you feel as a fan and as a player? It's, it's certainly strange. Um, I, I miss just the everyday going into training to, to play a game on the Saturday. Um, but like you say, there's there's absolutely no sport on. So if you want to just flick on Sky Sports to to watch something, I'm I'm quite enjoying watching a bit of golf, a bit of darts, anything. Um, and because it's not there, I think you took for granted a little bit um, at the start. But no, it's uh, it's it's strange times, like you say, and it's um, no one really knows what's happening or or how to deal with it. So we just got to make do with with uh, the best we can and. I think when um, when all sport comes back, I think it will be um, it will be massive. And I think you know football has has a hard deal, doesn't it? Sometimes you know, and there's a lot of talk around you know the fans with racism, chanting homophobia, and and I think it's get a little bit kind of tempered. Do you think this gap that we've had with no football at all maybe has given us a chance to reassess how we should go back to football? I think not just football, but everyday life. I think. Um, Obviously, everyone's taken a massive hit in, in the last couple of weeks and it's kind of made you step back a little bit and, and reassess, like you say, and, and think what's, what's really important and how you, you, you mentioned the, the racism and, and stuff like that, how to, to condone yourself and how things should be done properly. So it is, it is uh, testing times, but it's also time for great reflection as well. Yeah, and in terms of reflection, obviously, we're nearly at the end of, of the league. Uh, season thoughts on Swansea's position and and what will happen when you go back if if the league does go to start again well three points off the playoffs so we're, we're in a fantastic position um the promotion to the Premier League is obviously everyone's dream in the championship and I think there's a there's a fair few teams that could say they're in with a shout so it needs to be done properly um Whenever, whenever we do go back, I think it needs to be um, organised properly and and given everyone the best chance to be to be at their very best. Because the last thing you want is is just to play these games and and finish the season, get it over and done with, if you like, and um, and not take it as seriously as as you probably once would. Um, so I think it needs it needs some great thought um, and and to be done properly. So there's no what ifs buts and, and maybes everyone's been given a fair chance um everyone in in the best positions 
fight equally to to get promoted to the Premier League, and I think that's all we can ask for. And in terms of Swansea's position, you know, all teams will be away in the same position in terms of players and houses. Is there anything you can let us in on that Swansea are doing maybe a little bit different? Any secrets? Well, to be honest with you, I don't really know what uh, everyone else is doing, so I don't know if there'd, there'd be many um, many secrets. Um, but no, I think it's just just uh, keeping ticking over, making sure you're mentally ready as well as physically for, for when we go back, whenever that is. Um, if that includes a little break um, to to refresh and recharge a little bit, then then that's what's needed. But no, I think I think every every team will be doing um, similar things, just probably a few tweaks here and there. But like I said, you, we just don't know when we'll be back. So that's probably the the hardest part: planning for something that you don't know is when when it's going to arrive. Do, do different players in your team have different kind of approaches to that? Because I expect you know some people are, are nervous about the fact that it could all suddenly come back on or is there different personalities which help with that? I think there's different personalities in uh, every dressing room. I think some players obviously, uh, myself included, I've played 37 games or something this year, whereas some players may have only have played 10 to 15. Um, so I think that takes a, um, takes a little bit of a toll. Um, I think if you're a player that's just come out of the team, you'll want to be going back um, hit the ground running and it's, it's similar to pre-season really um, but then obviously if you've played a lot of games you need to uh, freshen up and, and keep your legs fresh because if you work through this whole period doing training gym running everything then by the time you get to July and August if the season starts again then you may be in a position where you're not physically capable to play two three games in a week. I think this situation has proven that no sector of any business or sport is safe from, you know, the, the coronavirus. Do you think this will maybe make some players think twice about the, the position they're in as professional footballers? Um, I don't know. It, it's hard to say. It's hard to say how different people will react to, um, to uh, things that are happening at the minute. But what I would say is a it's a global pandemic. Everyone's in the in the same boat. Businesses, business owners are, are being affected massively by it. So we're not we're not alone. Uh, no one's alone. We're all in this together. Yeah, we don't know when um, when it's going to finish. When when what the right procedure is for for um, any business. But like I say, we're all in this together. So we need to we need to stick together and do what's right by the global community. And I'm not going to go down the route of, you know, players' wages and all that, because I think there's, there's still a lot to be said and a lot to be sorted out. And I don't think it's fair. Every club is different. But do you think that footballers, like Wayne Rooney said, are given a bit of a hard time in terms of, you know, the way that maybe they're talked about? Um, I think so, yeah. I think um, footballers in general, we, we do give a lot back to the community. And a lot of footballers um, are very uh, well off. And, and privileged in terms of what they earn. Um, so it is, it, it is something that we should uh, look into. And I know that we are um, look at, looking at giving something back. But at the end of the day, like I said, we're all in this together. We need to, we need to stay united. You can't start um, pointing a finger at these should be doing this, these should be doing this. I think you just need to um, focus on yourself, do whatever you can to to help the economy and uh, everybody else through it, the ones um, in less privileged positions than ourselves, and um, and yeah, it should be a it should be a time of really uniting together and not um, not pointing the finger, in my opinion. Yeah, absolutely, and I think this has shown as well the importance that football clubs have within their own communities. No matter how big the club is, they are sometimes the heart of people's lives, aren't they? Yeah, well, I've I've said in many interviews before that. I, I can speak from experience because Swansea feels like a family. The whole community, um, the, with the football club at the heart of it, everyone, everyone loves Swansea. Everyone loves living here. Everyone loves the football club. So it's it's certainly something where, for myself, I, I love being here. I, I love Swansea City. So anything that I can do to to give back to the community or to help out the football club, then I'll do. And a lot of the players, if if not all, will all be in the same boat. Now, I don't know about you, but I thought I'd be getting through a million series on Netflix, but I haven't actually. I've been pottering around my house, you know, trying to do some work. But what's, what's the type of thing you've been doing to keep your mind off just being at home? Do you know what? I've actually um, taken to gardening. 
my yeah my um my girlfriend's been um not nagging I I wouldn't say nagging I don't want to paint her in a bad light but she's been asking me to um do it for a little while um and it's something obviously in the season that I'd I'd never really be able to get round to um with so many Saturday Tuesday games I always give it the heart I've got another game in two days card so um so now I don't have that excuse I'm I'm been out there shoveling and, and digging away so that's coming along nicely any plants that you've become particularly do you know what it's actually just the bulk stuff that I've been doing now our, our garden has like a bit of a slope and we just had patios laid so it all needs to be the same level so I've kind of just been digging it up and, and relaying it um for the minute but once it gets to the plants and stuff I'll let her take over I've spoken to a few other sportsmen and women they've been on the playstation a lot it, you playstation or xbox is that another is that another pastime? Play, yeah playstation with my mates yeah that's um the well there's nothing really much you can do once you've been out for your hour a day or whatever in, in my case i walk the dog um for an hour that's that's it so you're you're stuck inside and if there's nothing to do then playstation's a perfect pastime i was gonna say with asking about players who are footballers and then playing fifa is it weird when you play people you know or yourself or whatever um, I don't know. I think it's just something you get used to, to be honest. Um, I only really play pro clubs with my mates, so you you just make your own avatar and, and just play with them. So um, I, I'm not big into uh, Ultimate Team or, or FIFA seasons. If if I played anyone, I'm sure I'd lose. But, um, but no, I just I just play the um, the pro clubs one. When you make your avatar, what you, what skills do you give yourself which you want to improve on? <laughs> I'll make it. Um, exactly the opposite of what I am so I'll make him really quick I'll make him skillful dribbling and good at shooting so none of the traits I possess in real life. Going back to your your day job you're Swansea club captain you're only 24 that's a real you know weight on someone's shoulders that young but how are you enjoying it? Yeah loving it I, I, everyone says um, um, I think the word they use is burden but I, I can't see how how it would be a burden um, I'm immensely proud, my family are immensely proud of, of being in the position that I'm in. Um, and to be honest with you, it was, it was tough to start with. First couple of months, it, um, um, it was tough to get used to, to the role and, and to learn all the, all the things that come along with being a captain. But I felt like I learned on the job quite well. Um, and now we're in the position we're in, it's a completely uncharted territory for, for everyone. So. It's new to me, and and like I say, I'm I'm still learning even now. So it's it's a challenge that I took on um, head first, and uh, and I'm really enjoying. What are the type of things that you've taken on, which you didn't realise was captain kind of duty? Um, I, it's not that I didn't realise it. It's just because um, I, I always I always knew it would be more interviews, more. Um, play a liaison. I need to to speak to the lads, be a bridge between the manager and and the players. So I knew I knew uh, what the job entailed, but it's just kind of doing it. Is uh, there's always something uh, different each day to to tackle. Um, if if there's any players that need a need a chat to, then I have to be the person that's there. So I think it was more the um, more the amount that you had to do rather than what. Because I knew exactly what I had to do. It was just, it was just the amount that um, took me a little bit of a surprise. Have you always been a leader in your career from a from a young age? Um, I like to think so. I, I, I'm probably not the most vocal captain um, in the world, but it's, I'm certainly one that likes to lead by example. Um, so I've I've always tried to do that um, throughout my career. It started when when my dad was coaching me um, when I was very young. Um, and kind of took it all the way through. I always have to be the most professional, the hard work, hardest working. Um, so I think it, it started when I was young through through my parents and I took it on with me to now. And you, you had a really amazing start to your career with Exeter City and then you got signed by Swansea City in the Premiership. How, how was that jump? Oh, it was, it was phenomenal. <laughs> um, when I think back now, it was the, the golfing class between League Two and the Premier League was like something else. I went from like watching these guys on Match of the Day to sharing a dressing room with them. So it was like, I wouldn't say um, awe was the right word, but it was certainly strange to go from League Two where you, you, your players are fairly well known to 
the Premier League where they're like global superstars. So um so yeah, it um it took it it took a bit of time to adapt, but I felt like I did that well in three or four months, say. And since then I was uh, I was loving it. And you went out on loan, didn't you, to a few clubs? How did how did that affect you as a player and, and, and as as a man really? Um, well, I had I had three loans: Blackburn, Leeds, and Northampton. And I would say I learned different things uh, from each of them. Blackburn was to try and get me playing again um, because I'd I'd gone a year and a half or something without without playing many uh, league games. So it was just important to get out. I, I was only there for three months, but really enjoyed my time there, and uh, that got me a call up to the under twenty one national team. Um, and then Leeds, uh, I went there hoping to get a full season of, of games under my belt. Didn't quite work out, but again, that's probably one that I, um, I learned the most from, to be honest. Um, and then Northampton, because the, the Leeds uh, loan obviously didn't work out very well. I, I had to drop down a league to League One. And that was all just about falling in love with football again. I, and I did that. Um, I, I absolutely loved my time at Northampton. Um, played every single game that was that I was available for. So it was, yeah, it's been some journey. And um, and like I say, I, I learned so much from from each of them. And there's not one that I would change for anything. Yeah, Leeds, you said we should tap his uh, loan. Why was that? Um, I just didn't. I just felt like I never really got a chance to play. To be honest, I started the first game of the season and didn't play very well, um, and that was that was my only start in the league. So it was kind of like, well, I, I didn't really get a chance, but then I didn't take my chance. So it was one of those where I learned more by not playing about myself, about a lot of other things. Um, and I, I use it as fuel now. I, I think to myself, I'm never going to let that happen again. I'm never going to be in that position where I'm fighting a losing battle to try and try and get back in the team when I know that it's it's never really going to happen. And it was a lot down to myself. And like I said, I've I've learned from it. Talk to me about football players when you play and you've had a bad game. Because as a hockey player, you know we'd have three people watching us. Probably two of those would be dogs. Um, and if you had a bad game, obviously as an international player, you 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 would it would bother you all weekend. But for footballers, you're on a stage where people are watching you in the crowd. It's on match of the day. How much does yeah. that affect you if you've had a bad game and then you you hear it? See, I think I think people underestimate how much it really does affect you. Um, I'm I'm the first to know that I've had a bad game, so I'm beating myself up already. But then for other people to not not put me down that's that's the that's the um wrong thing to say because i don't i don't think people intentionally go out there to to hurt people or there's obviously a lot of stuff on social media now where it's like be kind or or whatever um but obviously people fans pay their money so they expect to see you perform on a saturday if you don't perform on a saturday you're frustrated and the fans are frustrated. So the fans vent their frustration at you, which is fair enough because they're, they're at the game. They've spent their, um, spent their money to, to pay for a ticket, which obviously we're, we're all very grateful for. So they, they have a right to, to um, have an opinion. Obviously, they're only opinions, but then sometimes if, if players have two or three bad games in a row and people are calling them out, calling them this, that and the other... It, it does start to, to weigh down on you and having like talking from personal experience I've I've had that in, in the past and um and it is one of those where you stop trying to play for yourself where, and you're trying to play to impress other people which which isn't isn't the way to be. Um but again it comes with the territory like you said you're you're playing in front of thirty, forty thousand people every week and and people are gonna have these opinions. It's just how thick-skinned you are and and how you have to carry on with it and think, right, I'm going to prove these people wrong. And I think, you know, when I spoke to Sol Bamba, he spoke quite, you know, passionately about social media and, and the use of it. As a young player coming through, I think there's a huge press, pressure, isn't there, on young men, you know, when they're, when they're reading this. Would, what do you talk to your fellow teammates? You know, what advice would you, do you give them or give yourself? I would just say don't read it. <laughs> to be honest, that 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 is the easiest way. I completely agree with Sol, um, with what he said. It's social media at the moment is almost how 
can you turn a positive into a negative or how negative can you be on top of a negative that's already happened i see i see a lot of people um if someone's had a bad game they'll just jump on the bandwagon and be like oh he was rubbish today he was this he was that he doesn't deserve to wear the shirt and it's like hang on like this is a guy yeah he's he's not had he's not had his best game but it's not for the lack of trying it's you have a bad day at work you don't have people who stood over you saying oh that was rubbish that was rubbish that was rubbish so i think Social media just gives people a platform to abuse and there'd be absolutely no consequences. And I think that's very, very wrong because obviously we've seen all in the media recently um, what it can do to people. And I think people don't understand that. Yeah, and I think as well, you know, there's a perception that, you know, footballers are doing all this money. How can they possibly, you know, be down about football or depressed? But actually, yeah. mental health you know is an issue. That is, that is the biggest... Um, I don't even know what word to look at. It's the biggest lie in the world. It doesn't matter if you earn £100 a week, £1,000 a week, a million pounds a week. You're still a human being at the end of the day. And no amount of money will ever make you think, oh, I'm above that, or what they're saying doesn't affect me. It's, it's impossible. And if you ask any footballer, I'm sure, well, I'll say 90% of footballers will all say the same thing. Money... Yeah, it's nice to to have um, a nice life on on good good wages. But then, if you're not playing, you're injured, you're playing poorly. You would give all that money back to to regain your form, be back out on the pitch um, for any amount of time. So, it is probably the biggest lie in in the football world that oh he earns X amount, so he can take it. Oh he was rubbish today, and he shouldn't he should feel bad about it because he earns this. It, it, it doesn't make sense. Though. Do you think maybe players and media alike then could work a little bit better together to maybe show the stories of footballers, you know, in a better light? Because obviously in, in the news this week, we've had, you know, two footballers in the Premiership doing things which they shouldn't be doing. Should mm. we be working maybe and being a bit kinder and, and showing all the stories? I, th- I, I, I personally think the... Um, sometimes you can't win um obviously marcus rashford has has done an unbelievable thing um in this in this uh pandemic but if you if you rewind the clock a little bit and um and there's players or not even let's let's talk not even football related um i saw i read uh, a multi billionaire or something donated 100 million to some charity i don't know exactly what it was and I'm I'm reading through Twitter and I'm reading the comments and it's like, oh yeah, but he has this amount, but he has that amount. And it's kind of like, he's just donated a hundred million pounds. Like regardless of what he earns, what he has, he's just donated that sum of money to this charity. So how is how can that not be a positive thing? So I think we're answering your question. I think we do do a lot in the media to um, to say, look, he's doing this, he's doing that. But the negative perception of it is, say a footballer's on 500 grand a week and he donates 10 grand a week to his chosen charity, people will say, oh yeah, well, 10 grand's nothing to him. But at the end of the day, it's still 10,000 pounds to this charity. So 10,000 pounds over a year is, I don't know, off the top of my head, uh, a week. So 520,000 pounds over a year. So it's like, you should be applauding that. But the way it is at the moment, like I said previously, anything positive is like spun negatively somehow. And I, and I don't see how that, that can be possible. Yeah. And I think, you know, like within sport, football, you know, is definitely the, the English national game. And I think, unfortunately, it does, it, it does get a bad rep. And I would I've definitely seen that as a, ju- a journalist. Um, talk to me about, we mentioned Sol Bamba, Cardiff City. Obviously, you had the first derby um, I think it was for five five years or six years or something, and it was your first South Wales derby. How did you feel about yeah. that? Um, it was amazing, to be honest. It was probably one of the, one of, if not the. No, I'm gonna I'm gonna go out there. I'll say it's the best game I've ever played in. Um, it was just the atmosphere was sensational. The fans, every everything about the day um, at the Liberty Stadium was just perfect. We won, clean sheet, played well. It was, uh, no, it was, uh, if you could write fairy tales, and obviously Ben Wilmot on his first start, 
scoring the winner was just, and yeah, it was phenomenal. It was my first South Wales derby as well. And, you know, I've been to quite a few events as a journalist. And sometimes, you know, once you've been to one, you think, oh, it's another. But Jenny, when I walked up those stairs, the noise hit me like a sonic boom. Can you feel mm. that as players? Oh, yeah, of course you can. It's, it's massive. I, it's a bit of a cliche, you know, um, saying the 12th man. But it really, it really does make a difference. That I, th- I forget the, um, how many were there, but 22 odd thousand. And as you're walking out onto the pitch, you can just hear the noise. It gives me goosebumps feet, thinking about it now. Um, you can just hear the noise around you and you think, wow, I'm playing for all these people. I'm playing for the pride of all these people for, for bragging rights, really. And that was what that was what did it for me. I think it's what did it for everyone. We thought we're representing the city here, not just the football club, but the whole city. So we gave it everything. And like I said, it was the perfect outcome. Well, you seem to have taken Swansea completely to your heart. You know, how, how are you enjoying life in Wales? Oh, I love it. I absolutely love it here. It's... it's when when the sun's shining and um, and got beaches um, at the front door, I love it. Girlfriend loves it. Little dog loves it. So um, so I know I'm I'm perfectly happy here, and it is it is somewhere that is very close to my heart for sure. I've been here for five years now, and I spent time out on loan. But last year and this year, I I found my feet, and um, yeah, I'm loving life. And and in terms of you know your career now as a footballer was it something that you always wanted to be was it from a little boy what you dreamed of um I, th- well, I think any boy that said that they didn't want to be a footballer when they were young is probably lying to you <laughs> um so yeah it's it's something that I, I never ever thought that I would do but it was well I never thought I'd make it to the extent that I have but I always wanted to be a footballer I'd always begged my dad to take me to football and my mum and dad were, were unbelievable when I was growing up, um, ferrying me here, there and everywhere around the country to to make sure I was um, playing and giving myself the best chance to be in this position. And you got your um, under 20 and under 21 England caps. Talk to me about that experience. Surreal again. Um, uh, I remember the first time I was called up to the under 20s I was still at Exeter so that was like a shock because no League 2 player really gets called up to, to the England sides um, so it was it was um, yeah again surreal I'd, 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 there's no other word to describe it and I kind of I kind of just took it in my stride just hoped that I played well enough for England to be uh, called up the next time and the next time and the next time and thankfully I did that um, and then my under-21 call-up was phenomenal. Um, I remember actually seeing it on Twitter uh, that I'd been called up. And then, obviously, Gareth was the uh, was the manager at the time. He was fantastic with me. Um, we went and won the Toulon tournament that summer. Um, and then, yeah, it was, it was one of those things that I kind of just... I don't really think back on, but when I think back on it, I think, wow, yeah, it's, uh, it was a massive moment in my career. So you found out on Twitter before you got the call from Gareth? Yeah, it was weird. It was weird. It was, um, uh, the, yeah, the very first time I got called up, um, the, the squad gets announced on Twitter and I saw my name because the, um, the signal is not great at um, Blackburn's training ground. So I saw on Twitter because we had Wi-Fi but no signal. And then I thought, oh, like, I wonder why, I wonder why I've not, like I had a text or anything, walked out of the training ground when I was finished and then all the texts came through saying, oh, just to let you know, you, you're going to be called up, etc. But this was like two hours before I had the, the Twitter notification. <laughs> um, so yeah, so it was, uh, it was a little bit strange, but then that was the first time. But then the second time uh, I, had, I had Gareth on the phone and he, um, he let me know um, himself. And talk to me about Gareth because he seems to have changed the way that England are perceived really I mean the, the, the World Cup in the summer it, it was definitely again from a media public perception there was a different feel from working with him how would you describe him? Do you know what I think in any sport um, the team has to portray the manager so the manager puts to hit to the team what his ideas are how, how he wants the team to conduct themselves how he wants them to play, all of those things. And I think the England team do that spot on. 
I think he has moulded them in his own image so well. And just from working with him only a few number of times, um, I could tell that that is exactly how he would he would go about it. And I'm not shocked in the slightest that he's been so successful with England. He's completely changed the culture around it. He's completely changed the way they're played, the way they're perceived. And he's done it in his own image. So he's given to the team what he thinks it should be. And, and he's absolutely nailed it. And if ever a team um, looked like a manager, it's the England team. Everyone loves them. Everyone wears their heart on their sleeve exactly like he does. And they're a, uh, a big success. Do you think that's helped because he was the player he was and then he's coached the youth teams? Um, I think so, yeah. He's, he's, obviously, he was the under-21s manager for a long time before he, he got the senior job. And I think that's what helped him in a way because he already knew the setup of it. He already knew how it, was, how it would run. And he was, well, in, in my opinion, before he even got appointed the job, he was the, the best candidate for the, for the job. And, um, and like I said, it's, it's no surprise that he's, he's doing so well because even just working with him a few times um, in the tournaments, um, I knew that he would, he would be a top manager one day. And have you still got ambitions to get that senior call-up? Oh, for sure. I think every player does. I think every player, um, English player, definitely does. Uh, I'm only 24, so I've, I've still got a little bit of time left. Um, if, if I can take Swansea to the, to the Premier League and, and play there for well for a couple of seasons, then who knows? And, you know, like I said, you're only 24, you're club captain, you've achieved a lot, you've learned a lot. Some advice for some young girls and boys watching this? Um, I would say. Um, never think that you've um, completed it or never think, oh, I've made it. Because as soon as you think that, football will chew you up and spit you out. I've had, that was probably um, my biggest mistake at Leeds. Um, I came from a premiership team to a championship team. I thought, oh, I've dropped down the league, so I'm guaranteed to play every week. But that is just not the case. There's always someone fighting for your shirt. So if you're not on it every single day, then you'll lose it quick enough. And obviously, we don't know how long we've got left in isolation. Talk to me about, maybe tell some things that we can watch or do, obviously, apart from gardening. Any, any tips for keeping busy? I would, I, would, I would say definitely stay away from gardening. <laughs> um, I don't know. I've, I've watched um, the Sunderland documentary. So if you're missing football, I think that's a, that's a decent watch. Even... Even though I know how the, the season concludes for them, I'm still like raring them on to get promoted. Um, so that's a decent watch if you're missing if you're missing football. But other than that, um, I would say watch the necessities, power, Peaky Blinders, Game of Thrones, all those, make sure they're all uh, ticked off. But like you say, I think people are uh, filling their days with a lot more other stuff, so they're not really getting the chance to, to watch many series. I know I'm... I'm probably busier now than I am when I'm playing. Right, last question from me. The season's going to resume, hopefully. Can Swansea get into those playoffs and hopefully get promoted? For sure, 100%. Well, thank you very much. We've been at home with Matty Grimes, Swansea City captain. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me.